This lecture will be about dynamic graphs, and the main objectives for today are to define what a dynamic graph is. We'll talk about metrics over time, what that means to evaluate similarity and compare networks from time slice to time slice, and actually define sim uh, metrics for network similarity. So first, when we talk about dynamic graphs, let's understand what they are. So we can define them uh, in comparison. So before we've talked about static graphs, uh, where we have some G that's composed of V and E, where V represents the vertices in our graph and E represents the edges in our graph. And in general, or everything we've done for most of the semester, assumes that the vertices and edges in our graphs don't change. And but we know that that's not true, especially when we consider social media, where people add friends or delete friends, new people come onto the graphs, or new people come onto the networks. So, so we know that this is a simplification. So dynamic graphs let us account for this by saying vertices and edges and attributes can be added, changed, or deleted over time. And then the set of vertices for the graph uh, can be represented as the union of all vertices over all time slices. And the set of edges likewise can be defined as the set uh, or it's the union of all edges for all time slices as well. Now this is not new, we've seen this before uh, in terms of, of graphs that we've looked at for like the barabasi albert model uh, and things like that where we've talked about nodes that come into the graph and when we've talked about building time series and comparing behaviors from one point in the graph to another point in the graph. But there are definitely a bunch of examples uh, for dynamic graphs. So the internet you can think of as a dynamic graph where new servers or new nodes are added to the graph over time. The BA model, is, as we've talked about, is, is very clearly a dynamic graph by definition, where new nodes come in to the graph and are parameterized by some value of M that says how many new or how many uh, new edges are created to these existing nodes in the graph based on preferential attachment. The actor network, the IMDB network, or the uh, oracle of Kevin Bacon that we've discussed before as an example, you can also think of as a dynamic graph as new movies are created. And generally, many social networks, in fact, are dynamic graphs by uh, the process, the social processes that define how people join or the dynamism in that you and I could be friends now, but we may not be friends tomorrow, or how you even define the graph in terms of mentions or engagements and interactions. So we can break down the types of dynamic graphs into two different axes. Uh, the first is about time, uh, stretching from discrete time points or dynamic graphs with discrete time to continuous time. Where discrete time could be time slices where everything happens in a particular time slice or one time slice to the next. And you can have many events happen in a specific time slice. All the way to continuous time where uh, time is just counting up and at a particular moment in time, maybe an event happens or maybe it doesn't. And then we have the other dimension of evolution. This is basically deterministic versus stochastic. Deterministic means we know exactly what will happen in the next time step, and stochastic is a degree of randomness. So the kinds of models that we see in the top left, discrete stochastic models, the BA model is, 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 is discrete. We have a discrete time point where a new node is added, but it's stochastic in that we don't know what nodes the new node it's attached to. We know the probabilistic aspects of it, that you're more likely to be attached to a node with, many, with a high degree, but we don't know specifically which one will happen. Uh, on the continuous side, social networks are generally continuous and stochastic. Who you join or who you uh, in, engage with uh, is relative or can be considered relatively random. On the bottom left, we have types of models that we'll talk about uh, in the next part of the module, uh, k-threshold models or collective action models or payoff models, all of those are generally discrete time, where there's a time slice of some form, and deterministic in that we know uh, at least what should happen in the next time step. And in the bottom right, we have these continuous but deterministic things. Uh, the internet is definitely continuous. The uh, IMDB network is continuous because they're real world networks that, that are based on time. But we know what will happen, right? When we add a new node, uh, when a new movie is created, we know who is in that movie uh, at the time of creation. Likewise, when we add a server to that, or to the internet, when we connect it up, we know where it's going to connect to uh, definitionally because of where we are. 
So there's a lot of complexity in that definition, sure, uh, but you may ask, well, why do we care from the standpoint of social networks? Well, there's the, the obvious reason, say you have some network, there's some core person in the network, some influence, influential person uh, who primarily, whose role is primarily to connect people to cat pictures, right? But if some terrible thing happens and, and that person's ability to connect uh, people to their cat pictures goes away, then what happens and people become sad because they no longer have access to their uh, dog rates accounts or the golden ratio accounts that are sharing these cute pictures of animals. But we can ask more questions about this, about, well, now what will happen to the network of people who are engaging? Will they sort of uh, separate into their own clusters of people? Or uh, as polarization occurs in these networks, uh, what happens? Do people sort of join together? Or do they stay in their, in their echo chambers? Uh, or do we find ways to rebuild these connections uh, between the clusters of network? So that's one question if we're trying to understand how information flows or how populations or communities may uh, re-engage or disengage. We can also think about this in terms of parameters. Uh, so parameters over time. What happens when we add new behavior or add new content to a graph? So one of the things we've talked about previously is, is the diameter of a graph or the maximal shortest path. And you could imagine if we are trying to uh, optimize some social network to, to get people to the content they care about most as rapidly as possible, which is what you might think the uh, major platforms are trying to do, or at least were for some amount of time, then it, it's important, an important question to ask, well, as we add nodes to the graph, as we add edges to these new nodes, how quickly can people get access to new information? Or if you are a marketing campaign or you're trying to run some marketing campaign, but you can't pay to put your ad in front of everyone, uh, but you want to have some insight about, well, what does the graph need to look like? Or at what point in the graph sh uh, should I start to add my advertisements to make sure that people see them relatively quickly or the word of mouth can spread rapidly? Uh, and it turns out that as we add edges to the graph, this can have a particular impact on network diameter based on the network models we're using. We do the same kind of thing with centrality as, as metrics. So as we add new edges, uh, per, perhaps we're talking about shares or retweets or mentions in social networks, uh, we can ask questions about how does the centrality of, of particular nodes change over time, which could be useful for identifying uh, influencers or people you want to pay to spread your message or people who might become influential in, in the future. So a number of kinds of, or there are a number of kinds of questions that we can ask, or different kinds of questions here. Things like, what's the current shortest path between two individuals, uh, and how might that change? It's important if we want to spread information, if you're playing some game about message passing, or you want to get information out, disseminate information out as quickly as possible. Uh, who are becoming more or less central in the network? So this is important for a marketing perspective or for epidemiology that we'll talk about next time. Is the graph becoming more or less connected? Uh, this has particular value if you're trying to understand political conversation online or the resilience of a network to different kinds of, of shocks. Uh, as the network becomes more connected, information flow is easier, which is in some sense good, but as the network becomes more connected also, uh, the opportunity to spread misinformation or spread of a virus also increases. So there's maybe some balance here, depending on what you're trying to do. Are communities growing or shrinking is a valuable question, especially if you're uh, doing marketing or trying to understand the level of interest in a particular topic or group. Uh, how is the community that's discussing that group or discussing that topic rather uh, changing over time? So these are interesting questions, but we want to ask additional things about or we want we want to concretize or uh, better define or formalize these kinds of questions. So in the BA model, we've already talked about the idea of time steps, right? So at each time step, a new node is added. And the difference between a time step and a new node is, is relatively uh, porous because by definition, a time step occurs when a new node is added. But we can talk about this graph and, or these, this model in terms of these uh, distinct time steps. We can also talk about metrics over time, looking at these time se series data. So how many tweets per day, per hour, per minute? What does this kind of thing look like? 
So one way to talk about this is by defining what we call a keyframe. That is, for these, if we want to look at more discrete kinds of models or treat our networks as discrete, and we could always discrete, dis, we can always treat continuous models or continuous networks as discrete by creating these keyframes, uh, where we group a bunch of changes in a contiguous time set time frame into one moment, which we say, well, all of those changes essentially happen simultaneously. Uh, there's always value to doing this. Uh, Depending, depending on the models you're using, uh, but oftentimes you may do this just to account for very high fidelity in your time series. Uh, you, may, you may imagine Twitter has uh, time series data down to the millisecond, but even then, if two people on different sides of the world take the same action at approximately the same time, does it really make sense to count that as two different events? Or can we say, well, here's the set of events that happen at a particular second or a particular minute? So we'll treat that as a keyframe. So then we can discretize up these questions uh, about changes in network centrality or changes in metrics and grouping all of these events or sets of events into these keyframes. Now, why is this useful? So one of the things that we have done or a study that I've done is to look at a community around the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, now, this is a relatively active community online. Uh, oftentimes the disability community, uh, so people who have uh, physical impairments or, or motor impairments, these kinds of things, uh, use social media platforms to help them promote their political stance. Uh, because it's, you could imagine if you have a, a motor impairment or a, a motor disability, it becomes difficult to attend demonstrations in person. Uh, so given that, social media becomes a very uh, appealing channel for these uh, activists to demonstrate and advance their position uh, or advance their, their political message. But we well, one of the things we wanted to understand, now while there's a long history of activism by people with, with disabilities or people in the disability community, uh, over the past few years we've been able to look at two different instances of these, of these demonstrations. So in 2016, uh, the ADA community was very active in uh, the 2016 election around the hashtag Crip the Vote. And in 2018, there was a piece of legislation moved through uh, the House and then in, into the Senate for Congress uh, that was meant to change aspects of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in particular, this, this change was meant to uh, lower the burden for companies, that companies would not have to adhere to the ADA until they were sued or until some uh, issue was brought to court uh, by somebody who had been affected by lack of compliance. And this shifts the burden of compliance from the company, as it is in the ADA now, to an individual who has to have enough resources to then bring suit against one of these, uh, one of these companies. So people in the ADA community were uh, vastly against this change to the ADA. And what we wanted to understand was how did the behavior between 2016 and 2018 uh, change? Because in the end, this legislation uh, successfully passed the House of Representatives and moved on to the, moved on to the Senate, where it was eventually, uh, eventually quashed. But it's a good question here about what differentiates the demonstration or the mobilization aspects between 2016 and 2018. Uh, are there particular strategies that were used in 2016 that were not used in 2018 that led to differences in, in mobilization or differences in, in success? So by using this idea of keyframes, we can sort of break this kind of thing down. And this has been used uh, relatively popularly on email networks and uh, a number of other kinds of networks where the resolution of the network can change very very, or can be very different based on the, the width of your keyframe. So we'll come back to the ADA in a few minutes, but you could imagine trying to understand, well, from a keyframe perspective, what is the difference between the behavior in second, uh, in one second of the Crypt the Vote 2016 campaign to another second versus one second of 2018 to another second of 2018. So maybe you want to do keyframes at the minute, or excuse me, keyframes at the daily or weekly level to get some better insights since you're doing comparisons. So we already talked about that. And now Gephi actually has 
a mechanic for doing dynamic graphs uh, built into it, which lets you do relatively nice visualizations over time uh, that, lets, or, that let you visualize how edges are added to the network or how nodes are added to the network and how this may change the, the structure of the network. You can do the same thing or similar kinds of things with Network X to uh, calculate metrics over time. There's a whole tutorial about, about using dynamic networks. Uh, I've posted a link to it on Canvas, so you can go check that out. And then I also have a Gephi demo that I'll go over here uh, in a second. All right, now that we have Gephi up, we can go through a quick demo of how to open a graph data set with Gephi, convert it to a dynamic graph, and then do some visualization. So first we'll open a GraphML file. So this is one I created using the Barabasi Albert model we have time series information. And we'll go ahead and import it. Now we see a bunch of nodes here, right? We can go into the data lab and we see there's this timestamp field that I've created in the data. So when I generated this, this graph uh, using the Network X graph generator, I made sure to add a timestamp field uh, to every node attribute or as a node attribute for all the nodes. So then we can convert this into a time series. So to do this, we'll go to merge columns and we'll set TS to long and then the merge strategy will be to create a time interval. There we go. Click OK and we can say to parse numbers default we can set all this to uh, defaults and we press OK. So now we have this interval and you see it's the same value uh, for start and end which is maybe not what you want in the general case so you could imagine instead of having a single time series or timestamp uh, column, you could have timestamp start, timestamp end, and use that for your interval. But now that we've added this interval field, we see this enable timeline button here. So we can go ahead and click that, and you get this is the time frame for the entire data set. So we have a time series for all 1,000 nodes. And if we go over here to the overview tab, we see we're showing all the nodes and edges. But we can restrict this by pulling this down. Uh, now we're looking at just a few of the edges in the graph. And if you press play, you can see how the edges get added or removed based on the timestamp that we are using in the data set. So we can end that. We can make this longer. And you can see how this changes. Uh, we can update this layout. So we'll use Furkham and Rheingold. We'll slow it down a little bit. 0.5, and we can hit run. And then we can actually run the Fruchtum and Rheingold graph while we're also running the dynamic graph aspect. So you can actually see how this changes over time. And we can expand this out to get the full data set, see how this goes, speed this up a little bit, so you can get a better visualization. Zoom out some. And then you can play with this as you want. See, as we restrict it down, we get fewer and fewer edges. So now this is a very small number of edges. We see they're down in the, in the center. And as we move over time, the graph will update. This is probably too few or too sparse. So we can increase the time window. And we can play around this, play around with this a little bit. We can update the layout algorithm and let that run while we let the graph progress forward in time. And you can see how the graph changes. We can pause and expand this out and see how the graph also changes over time. Uh, so you can do this with edges. You can do this with, with node attributes as well. And this lets you sort of visualize how the graph is changing over time uh, in a much more uh, exploratory way than you might if you were just looking at individual slices. So that's it. Uh, I'll put this file up, uh, this BA model M2 graph ML file on Canvas so you can play with this as well. The next thing we want to talk about is measuring network similarity. So what does this mean from, from a keyframe perspective or bringing this back to our discussion on keyframes? So in the comparison of the ADA community's crypt the vote 
activism versus the hands off my ADA demonstration in 2018, we can separate these time periods up into keyframes as we've discussed and that lets us do some things like evaluate who became more uh, central over time or how the communities around these hashtags were changing over time. You can already do that with this keyframe idea. Uh, but the question is more overall from one moment to the next or from one demonstration to the next, how similar are these uh, network structures. Likewise, the World Resource Institute hold, holds an annual uh, forum where they discuss landscape restoration and uh, other sort of environmental and climate related issues. And an important question here is how does the conversation around these events change over time? So uh, if you want to, one of the questions that they that the WRI was particularly interested in is as they continue to have these big forums, how do people or how are people being uh, invited into or taking part in this in this conversation? Uh, are they constantly talking to the same people uh, from year to year that the network's not really growing? Or are new people being brought into the network uh, each year? Because uh, obviously the ideal perspective would be Every year, new people are brought into the discussion. Uh, that sort of justifies the existence of this forum. But if constantly each year uh, it's the same group of people who are all talking to each other, this is in some sense uh, a bad outcome because they want to grow and expand the movement rather than uh, constantly talking among themselves. So then we ask, we are asked this question: You know, how do we evaluate similarity? Is how can we formalize this question or the answer about is the WR community in 2013 similar to that in 2014? Uh, or is the crypto vote demonstration similar to the hands off my ADA demonstration in 2016 versus 2018? So how do we actually do that? Well, there are a number of different ways. We can talk about this in terms of distance. Uh, we'll say that we'll talk about similarity or, or measuring the, the difference between two networks as looking at the networks in, in terms of distance between these two networks looking at the adjacency matrix of these networks. And then we can ask the question, well, how, how far apart are these two mat matrices? And there are a number of different metrics for this. There's Hamming distance, Euclidean distance, cosine distance, and others. Uh, oftentimes, what these do is you take your n squared adjacency matrix, and then you flatten it to a uh, vector of n squared columns and one row. And then you can apply your standard sort of vector similarity or vector distance uh, approaches to it. So for Hamming distance, uh, generally you assume an unweighted graph uh, where the adjacency matrix identifies whether two nodes are adjacent or not uh, with this binary one or zero. And then the Hamming distance is just the number of elements uh, that are the same between the two versions of your, of your adjacency matrix. In contrast, we have Euclidean distance where we can do weighted graphs. Uh, where your cells of your adjacency matrix represent weights. And then we can calculate the Euclidean distance between these two, these two vectors or flattened adjacency matrices that have become vectors and create some value. So this lets us evaluate, well, how similar are these networks from time frame or from time point to time point? So here is an example of looking at the WRI communities from 2013 to 2017. Uh, sliced up by year. And we can see that as the years increase, or as, as time moves, the network in 2013 to 2014, uh, in both Hamming distance and Euclidean distance, is low compared to that in 2016 and 2017. Now, the distance value itself, like Euclidean distance, seems to be about 100 in the 2013 to 2014 comparison, and about, I don't know, maybe 5,000 or 7,500. 7, in Hamming distance. Now that value may not tell you a whole lot directly, but we can look at the trends and say, well, the networks do seem to be getting more diverse or uh, less similar over time in a relatively consistent kind of way. Uh, cosine distance gives us a little bit of a different view. So like with Euclidean distance, we can treat uh, the values of our distance 
matrix as anything in the real number space. And then we can evaluate cosine distance between these two vectors, but we're going to get a quite a different result. Uh, whereas Hamming distance is uh, good for non-weighted graphs and Euclidean distance is good for weighted graphs, cosine distance works well for graphs that have uh, where the scale is maybe less important, uh, but has some, some aspect of scale to it. And we see quite a different sort of result here, where as in the, cos or in the Euclidean and Hamming distance uh, metrics, we saw an increasing dissimilarity over time. Here for cosine, uh, we see, well, first off, we're looking at cosine similarity versus cosine distance, which means we need to invert the axes. And then we have a difference, a, quite a significant difference from 2013 to 2014, where in Hamming and Euclidean distance, we saw uh, pretty standard or, or pretty consistent uh, increasing change or increasing diversity in the networks. Here we see that actually from 2013 to 2014 and 2014 to 2015, in 2014 to 2015, the networks actually were much more similar. So maybe there was less uh, diversity or less change in the network from 2014 to 2015. But then from 15 all up to 2017, we go back to this increasing distance from uh, or decreasing similarity uh, in these networks, which tells us something about how the networks are evolving. We can also use this to look at different kinds of networks. So before with the ADA and WRI aspects that I showed you, this was essentially the same network or this, the network around the, a network around the same kind of idea. We can also do this for different kinds of networks. Uh, so if you wanted to look at or compare a network of authors or users on Twitter to uh, web links. So for instance, you could imagine a network of journalists who are writing for different papers. Uh, then you have your nodes as authors and edges are whether they've written for the same paper or not. Likewise, you could do a slightly different version of that uh, network where you have nodes as authors and edges are whether two authors have cited each other or whether one author has cited each other in a particular, uh, in a particular article. And you can see there are different, uh, we get different metrics here um, where I looked at this for a set of uh, fake news related domains and the authors therein. And we see that Hamming and Euclidean distance diverge uh, quite a bit. So maybe looking at them directly is not as as informative as looking at the trends in these in these networks. And there are other kinds of measures as well. So you can look at uh, Pearson correlation and take these two matrices and evaluate covariance between them. We can compare that to what we've seen before. And we see kind of a surprising result where cosine similarity uh, goes up or is maximized in 2014 and 2015. Likewise, Pearson correlation is most negative in 2014 and 2015. It's kind of an interesting result. So this says that uh, as increases in uh, interactions in 2014 occur, we see decreases in interactions in 2015, which is kind of surprising. But uh, you should be careful when you're using these different metrics of similarity. Uh, Pearson in particular uh, is maybe problematic because the samples of A and A prime, these two matrices that we have, are generally not independent. Uh, we can kind of imagine that people who are friends with each other are because of some underlying uh, similarity, either homophil homophily or they, they live in... Uh, similar locations or they engage in similar topics or, or work in similar areas. So whether two people are connected uh, to each other is not an independent function of one person's connection to somebody else, uh, as we've seen with like the forbidden triad aspect or these, these clustering aspects that we've seen in the network and real social networks. But there are many other uh, similarity methods that you can use. Uh, depending on what your particular use case is, but it's valuable to help us understand moment to moment or keyframe to keyframe or being able to evaluate changes over time. So if we go back to this question about dynamic graphs, you know, why should I care? So hopefully I've already given you some good insight about being able to compare networks between events. Uh, so between two different uh, activist movements from the ADA community from point A to point B or 2016 to 2018, 
you know, who were the prime movers between these two, uh, these two events? Is there some consistent set of users or consistent set of individuals who often have high centrality or have high centrality in both of these events? Because uh, they might be your major activists, which in some sense you might know if you're embedded in the community, uh, but you can use this network as well to identify them or identify potential up and coming people who were not active in 2016, but became active in 2018. Which you might imagine happens much more often in uh, more dynamic social movements like Black Lives Matter. Likewise, you can compare networks over time, like I talked about, uh, trying to understand who are up and coming accounts, who's gaining and lo losing influence. Is the graph becoming more or less centralized? Uh, that last question was a, an interesting question we asked during 2016 about the information network uh, online in terms of who, where people were getting their news and information. Are they getting news and information from a uh, core source of mainstream media? Or as, as the popular press narrative would suggest, uh, is the network or the, is the news ecosystem sort of fracturing and becoming less centralized over time as more sort of fringe or, or alternative information sources become available? Uh, we actually found it was the latter, and at least looking in Twitter, that people sort of became more polarized into their own sets of, of news sources, uh, which has important implications for interventions or trying to bring these networks uh, close together or address issues of polarization in society. So that's it for the dynamic graphs portion. We have one more section for module six, and then that'll wrap up our coverage of dynamic networks and information cascades and time series data.